So my name is Rhys Jones. I'm a lecturer from Cardiff University in the School of Social Sciences. Um, my official title is Quantitative Lecturer, blah, 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 in Social Sciences. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about natural experiments in the social sciences. I'm going to give you a few pros and cons on the methods that I've used and hopefully help to inform what you do or give you ideas. And I would welcome any kind of questions or critiques um, at the end. If you, if you do want to ask a question during the presentation, that's absolutely fine. I'd rather you kind of put your hand up and ask while it's there in the context than keep it at the end and it might be a bit confusing. So my talk is based on three points, three areas. I'm going to talk to you about a little bit of history around experimentation in the social sciences um, and natural experiments in the social sciences. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about quasar experiments um, that are kind of adapted, a slightly adapted version of a randomised controlled trial. And then I'm going to give you um, a talk on a specific case study around the research that I'm involved with, which looks at, ironically, uh, maths phobia and maths anxiety um, for people who uh, need to use maths. So experiments. I love experiments. Um, I originally trained as a teacher, an FE lecturer, and I taught biochemistry and uh, chemistry to A-level students and degree students. I've been in education for about 10 years. And I firstly love experiments from an educational perspective, the teaching. I think they're great pedagogic hooks. They get people interested, involved, and it gets students to think critically and in particular when things go wrong. Because you ask students to make predictions on the outcome of an experiment, and if it doesn't happen, you think, well, why didn't it work? Is that what we were expecting? It gets those creative juices flowing, that critical thinking flowing. So that's really important from a teaching perspective. Okay. From a research perspective, I, um, before I went into teaching, I did some research in cervical cancer and asthma. And I, in a controlled laboratory environment space, you can control for certain factors. So most of the time in the natural sciences, in the physical sciences, we tend to use experiments extensively to try and see if the thing that we're changing can have an effect or impact on the thing that we're measuring. But that's in a very controlled environment and it doesn't tend to be as messy. So experiments are useful for all sorts of things to see if an intervention you've created to a problem that you've investigated can actually have a difference, have an effect. So RCTs, randomised controlled trials. So these are, um, you work on the premise that you have two groups, you can have more groups sometimes, but on the fundamental level you have two groups. One of them is the control group. People tend to think of a control group as uh, have a negative control, whereby you shouldn't see any effect, any difference in their effect on their out output. Um, and you're not giving them any treatment, so they should kind of, that's your baseline. And the intervention group, you can see at the top left, that's the group that you've done something to. You've put them in through an intervention, and you want to see if that's going to have an impact on the thing that you're measuring. Now, these are usually referred to as dependent and independent variables. So the independent variable is something that you as the researcher controls or you're trying to change to see what effect that has on the dependent variable, the thing that you're measuring. Okay? And the beauty of doing this is that you have random as assignment to try and take up bias. So you randomly assign participants to each of those groups. Now, this is quite difficult to achieve in social sciences because a lot of the time when we're working with certain groups of people, um, you, you can't randomly assign them. There's ethical reasons as well around it. So there needs to be kind of a, a slightly different method that you can try and adapt an RCT to make it more suitable to what you're doing. So some of the examples and challenges. Now, in British sociology in particular, 
there's more of an emphasis on qualitative research, I think that's well established, and of the quantitative researchers within social science, they tend to do more secondary data analysis. So as a method, doing experiments isn't extensively used in the social sciences, okay? However, in America, in the USA, there's a much greater use of these methods, particularly in education programs. And Donald Campbell, um, he helped to legitimise this as a, as a strategy in social sciences back in the, in the 70s. Um, now, one of the problems when you set up um, RCTs is the trying to get unequivocal results. So what we mean by that is differences in your groups at the end. Depending on your sample size, you might not see an impact on your intervention. It might not make a difference on your dependent variable, which is, as a researcher, that's what you're trying to see if there is a difference. And there's issues with the sample size. How big should your sample size be um, to get those differences? And as I said previously, it's difficult to achieve randomization, particularly in social sciences. Now, there's a lot of, some people kind of say, well, and people that engage with these research methods and say, well, if there's no evidence of effect, does that mean there's no effect? Not necessarily. Perhaps you have a too small sample size or you need to repeat the process a few times before you can rule out that there's no impact on, on your intervention, on the dependent variable, on what you're measuring. Okay? So that's something to bear in mind um, if you're thinking of using this. If, if you're not getting anywhere and you're not getting useful results, kind of keep bashing at it, you might find that there is a pattern there that you're looking for. So types of design. <coughs> so if you have random assignment of your groups, you can randomly allocate them to your control group and intervention group, then that would be a randomised control trial. And it's, as I said, seen as a gold standard. Now, I don't 100% agree with that. There are issues with RCTs, but it's one of the most useful tools that we can use um, and in terms of impact is the thing that policymakers and, and people that the movers and makers shakers people you can pre present evidence to and they'll they'll look at this and, and, and it, they'll see it as being valid now if you can't randomly assign your participants to groups you can use a quasar experiment and it's a very similar setup to an rct the, the major difference is that you can allocate individuals to groups, okay? So it's not randomised. And that is, it's very useful in the social sciences, to, especially when you're dealing with certain types of groups of people um, linked to your research question. So quasar experiments are similar to RCTs. They've been used widely in public health and community safety. And I think what you need to bear in mind that you haven't got an expectation that there's unequivocal results. You, obviously, you, you make your predictions initially and say, well, I've got this intervention or I'm investigating this intervention. Hopefully, it will have this positive desired effect. But if it doesn't, then it doesn't. Okay? And that's something to bear in mind. Um, negative results are, are all, also useful. There is, however, a threat to what we call internal validity. And that, and that can be quite a major issue. When you're trying to control for certain variables and using this very scientific method, um, as we know, social phenomena don't follow neat patterns a lot of the time, and we can't always explain them. So it's difficult to control for certain factors. So, for example, if we have an intervention and we find that there is an impact on our thing that we're measuring, then that doesn't necessarily mean that that intervention has had that impact. Other things could have contributed. But what it does do, it makes you reflexive, very reflexive, because you're thinking about all the things that could impact on your, the thing that you're measuring. Now, there are one-shot experiments, um, which means that you can kind of do them, sometimes relatively quickly, and it can give you results which will pave the way for further research. So that's quite useful as a tool. And as the uh, professor earlier was mentioning, that they use their quantitative results as a, a kind of initial um, way of starting to, for future research. It can be quite useful to direct or focus further research in the future. So, my, so I've talked about some of the pros and cons of using RCTs and quasar experiments. And I'm going to give you specific 
example of the research that I engage with at Cardiff University. Now, the, I was um, hired by Cardiff University several years ago as a lecturer to develop new courses, statistical courses, in context for A-level students. And the idea is that we were looking to see if it could enhance, change the students' attitudes to maths and statistics, but also change their attainment and critical thinking. So we, basically we're arguing that statistics is central to a lot of different subjects. And if we could get students to contextualise that statistics and use it as part of those topics, then it should enhance their learning. Now we know, particularly in the social sciences, there's a shortage of people with quantitative skills. And I'm part of the Q-Step Centre in Cardiff University. There's 15 in the UK, and they've been given a lot of money by government to increase the numbers of social science graduates with more quantitative skills. And we know that ministers value people with these skills. At the moment, in A-level sociology in particular, there's not a lot of quantitative stuff in there. It's more geared towards qualitative um, information and qualitative ways of learning the, the theories and, and sociological philosophers. Now, kind of as a side to this, so there's not enough quant in sociology at A-level. In A-level maths and stats, there's a move, a drive towards getting students to understand mathematics, not just by doing the calculations, but understanding the concepts. And the concepts I personally think are more interesting and helps to get students to think deeper, have a greater understanding on the subject. So both of these are trying to kind of move towards each other. Um, and there's this old political rhetoric around kind of maths for life. We've got core maths in England that's been introduced. And they're trying to get more students post-16 to do maths. So this is the kind of backdrop, the, the political and um, kind of agendas of the government around that. That, now, that's a really good question. Um, just to highlight, these, these problems aren't endemic to the social sciences. Um, I think there's a, a, a tr kind of, it's well known that people generally don't like maths and there's a phobia to it and they, they struggle with it in other disciplines, in the sciences as well. But I think there's a difference of attitudes. People that do science subjects and natural sciences know they have to do maths. And even if they're not comfortable with it, they will try. In the social sciences, students come in, they don't expect to do statistics or quantitative methods. So that's, you're trying to overcome that barrier as well, that, that change in attitude. Um, and interdisciplinary, that's, that, again, that's quite a central issue because statistics as a tool weaves through many disciplines and disciplines are interdisciplinary. So that's, that's a, a good point. But it makes things a bit messier as well. <laughs> now the RSS, the Royal Stat Statistical Society, and I sit on their education board, the RSS. So as a board, we try and kind of look at stats education across the UK and how that can be changed and enhanced. Um, with ACME, who are the A-level um, committee uh, advisory board, they as a group um, suggested that a research needs to be undertaken to follow students and the way, where they expose statistics, where they encounter statistics and where they see it throughout their education. Um, and they've given some ideas on the types of methods that could be used, but they, they want students to kind of see where they use it as a skill and how they value it. And that, if that information could be recorded, then they would find that very useful. And as we talked about, um, a lot of the issues around this are centred on the attitude towards maths and statistics and how people really are uncomfortable with it. A lot of the time from a negative experience earlier on in their educational kind of lives in GCSE down to primary school, people have experienced maths in a negative way. Um, I mean, there's a, a researcher at Warwick who describes maths phobia as a disease, as a pathology. And she's got a cure to kind of try and cure it. That's, that's quite interesting. So as part of my work, at Cardiff University, I developed a pilot scheme in a subject called social analytics, which gets students to understand social processes using 
statistical analysis and concepts. And the course was set up for two hours a week, um, for 25 weeks. And uh, a big part of getting this lifted was developing partnerships, um, working with teachers and working with students and getting them to see the value of this. Now, if you think back to when you were an A-level student, I, I know the A-level students that I've worked with, it's a very stressful time for them. Not only are they kind of going through puberty, some of them, but they're also dealing with three, four A-levels. There's pressure to get good grades, go to university. So asking them, would you like to do an extra course two hours a week? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. So I had to think of a way to sell it to these, these students, to get them to do it. Um, and the way I did it was to say, well, look, you'll get a certificate of attendance. There was no academic credit to it at all, and I was very explicit with that. But they'll get a certificate from the university. They'll come into the university and experience what it's like to be taught in a university style. Um, they, there was PhD students to help to teach them with some of their research um, involved. All the workshops and activities that they would do were just in the class, so they had no homework. And I used to be an admissions student, so I'd give them advice on how to fill in their UCAS application. So there's quite a few carrots for these students to come in and, and do this course. And it was free as well. That's, that's a really important thing. Um, it was free. Now, in Wales in particular, a specific context in Wales, students have to do an A-level called a Welsh Baccalaureate. And it, it's counted as a full A-level. It's graded um, A star to E. And half of the A-level, the students have to do a research project, which is 5,000 words, which is quite a lot for an A-level student to do. And they have to engage with primary and secondary data analysis. So in Wales, we expect students to develop these skills at A-level as part of the A-level subject. So it's, it, we could see that we could sell it to the students as helping them with their Welsh back as well. So I formulated kind of some research around this, this project. And my questions were, can a contextualised statistics course change the attitudes of your 12 and 13 students to maths and stats? Um, could it change the retainment in their A-level subjects where it was mapped to the curriculum? Would it change their ability? And there was a temporal element. So we were looking from kind of the beginning of the course towards the end. We were looking to see if there were changes throughout that cycle, throughout that phase. Okay. Now, it re is really important to think of your research aims first before you, you... I mean, you can have an idea of your methods, but I think a lot of researchers would agree you need to have your research questions kind of first in your head. Um, I have a lot of undergrad students come to me and say, I want to do surveys, I want to do symmetry. They, they think of the methods first and they haven't thought about the research. So that's, that's really key, thinking of those research aims before you select your methods. Now, from the research aims, um, admittedly, I could have used other methods to, to do this research and gain data, but kind of straight away I thought, this would lend itself well to an experiment, a quasi-experiment. And I, I was partly thinking forwards, the type of people that I have to work with and influence, I work with government ministers, I work with awarding bodies. Um, I know that they're used to seeing quantitative information. They have very short time. They don't have a lot of time to talk to you. So if you can give them kind of descriptives quite quickly, they tend to be more amenable and say, well, we've got an effect and we, we can show that this works. So that was partly my rationale why I chose this, because I was thinking of the output. Who's going to see this data and who am I trying to influence? So as part of the experiment, um, I had an intervention group. They were the students that self-selected onto the intervention group on the course. So that's why it's quasi. And a control group of about 90 students. The control group was larger. And the students in the control group were from the same colleges and schools and the same classes as the students in the intervention group. So I'm trying to control for the amount of education they receive in their classes. And I was looking at differences in critical thinking, maths and statistics. I gave them a series of formative tests, which were GCSE statistics. And ironically, I, I, I personally think GCSE stats is more difficult than A-level stats for a number of reasons. A-level stats, you just kind of have to answer things like do a chi-square, do a binomial, some, some stats questions. Whereas GCSE stats, you have to 
explain yourself and ask, answer questions like, well, what's the dependent variable? What would you do next? It's much more critical thinking in GCSE stats. So for, for me, I wanted to use that because that was kind of more in line with the, the type of teaching they were exposed to as the curriculum had changed. So they were the methods that I was using to measure my research questions. And here's some of the results. So we had two control sites, um, the red and the green, and the blue is the intervention group. And I gave them three formative tests throughout the 25 weeks. And as we move across here, the difficulty in the questions, the, the papers increased in difficulty. So I would expect them all to decrease as the course is increased. Okay. Now, from the beginning, you can see that this is the percentage of, of their marks, of what they've got. These two students, um, relatively kind of similar results. However, these performed a lot less. So that's, that's quite, uh, as a baseline result. As we move to the second snapshot, the, the red group, the teacher, unfortunately, her, her dad passed away. So she had to go back to Canada and she couldn't put on that formative test, which was, which was a shame. But you can see this decrease because it's got more difficult. Now we move towards the final um, result. You can see the intervention group have performed a lot better than the other two groups. So that would lead me to kind of just on this set of results think, well, perhaps the intervention is having an effect on their ability to, to, of, of contextualising statistics. Now I have got other sets of results to triangulate some of this, but not with me at the moment. Um, but that, that's just one set. So what are the challenges? Um, access is quite difficult when you do things. I think access is difficult generally if you do any sort of kind of research when you're working with people and groups of people. So um, developing your tone and the way you kind of sell what you're trying to help people with or, or give them the benefits is really important when, you, when you're thinking of getting access. Um, ethics, again, is quite difficult. And particularly in something like this, in an experiment, as part of the ethical procedure, I made sure that I wrote in it, well, if, if I see the students are starting to have a, is having a detrimental effect to the students, then I would withdraw the course. Um, and that was really important as part of the ethical procedure. You hope your intervention won't have a negative effect, but it could. So you, you do need to think of building that in. As we talked about, internal validity is something to think about. How do I know that that intervention ha is having an effect or changing the attitudes of the students? There could be other things that are interacting. So it does really make you think reflexively about what you've done. Sample size is also something to reflect on. The claims that you can make about your research um, is something you need to think about. And the cost. Um, it, was, it was relatively cheap um, to put this on. But I mean, moving forward, if I want to scale it up, then there might be more costs involved. So again, it's something to think of. Um, the triumphs. I have observed some differences. And as I said, it, it really makes you think reflexively. It makes you think about all the factors that could influence that group of people, those groups of people that you're measuring. Um, it's repeatable, which is quite useful with quantitative research. You can repeat it. And you can use it in addition to qualitative results. You can do a mixed methods approach. And it is fun. I find it really enjoyable collecting data. Um, I do some secondary data analysis, but I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, and I'd rather be kind of out in the field collecting data. So for me, I, I find this quite, quite fun. Um, just to say that there is some qualitative data there. Um, and here's some of the feedback from the students on the intervention group. So you can see that increased their confidence with talking about variables, it enriched their learning. Um, they enjoyed the discursive elements around it. Um, some of them said they didn't even realize they were doing stats or maths when they were learning this stuff because of the way it was taught. It was very different to what they'd identified maths to be like. So that was quite a useful, uh, interesting finding. I mean, one of them, quite honest, said they got the certificate at the end, they can put it on the UCAS form, and that's fine. Um, and that's me.